So I'll tell you a little bit about uh, recent work that we're doing in the lab. Um, and it came to us a bit serendipitously uh, through the uh, through two places. One was the state of New York, and the other one was the state of Florida, uh, who um, had um, archived records of uh, <clears throat> neonates that they do the uh, auditory brainstem uh, test, which is a routine test that is done at birth. Um, and they asked me, I had. I had invented uh, some new ways of analyzing uh, biorhythmic data uh, from biosensors, uh, from mics and video cameras and wearables, and your Apple Watch, your cell phone, anything that you actually carry in your purse these days. And, um, and they said, you know, maybe, maybe there is something here. So, I said, okay, let me have a look. And so I'm going to report to you what we found analyzing these waveforms that are routinely uh, uh, taken. And so with, with very little effort and cost, we could, uh, we could uh, use it to detect uh, neurodevelopmental derailment very, very early. Um, in one case, we, we looked at... Uh, over 200,000 uh, records in the state of Florida. And in the other case, uh, we, we looked at um, about 70 records. Uh, but the interesting, the interesting thing there um, in the state of New York is that these records, uh, they, they not only took it at birth, they, they tracked these babies. And by the age of three or four years of age, uh, they they saved the ones that had uh, um, the diagnosis of autism, so we could retro retrospectively look at what was different, and so that's what I'm going to be reporting to you. This is the um, team that we worked with. Uh, the the first two, uh, Eric London and Dr. Half, and they they are in uh, when it's a, a child psychiatrist and a child pediatrician that direct the. New Jersey State, uh, New, New York State uh, Institute for Brain Research in Developmental Disabilities. Uh, the other three folks are in the University of Miami. And um, in particular, Rafael Delgado has a company that creates these um, portable uh, devices. Uh, he's an electrical engineer by training. And these devices, you take them to the NICU and to the uh, birth um, ward and in the in pediatrics, and uh, we can then administer different pulses, and it's, it's all very controlled and so forth. So uh, the other uh, on the bottom uh, row are three. The first three are, are graduate students in my lab and in pre med, and the last two are in, at the South Zinowski. I did my sabbatical there, and Rusty Gage. I also worked with his lab and. I'm not going to present the results from that work, but it was uh, an analysis of um, embryonic, human embryonic stem cells, uh, transcriptome data, uh, utilizing this same concept. And we um, just recently published our first paper on that work. And it's, it's broader um, across neuropsychiatric and neurological disorders, but also we found 72 genes that overlap with those associated with uh, autism uh, from the Simons Foundation uh, database and uh, a, a set of genes associated with brainstem-related disorders and cerebral palsy. And so I won't talk about that work today for lack of time, but um, uh, it's, it's very interesting as well what we found there. So the motivation, of course, is that we have a tremendous race in uh, exponential rate of diagnosis in autism. It's gotten out of hands. Uh, we have uh, a lot of problems with the diagnosis system in terms of um, how broad it has become, uh, covering um, uh, sensory issues, ADHD, um, 
cerebral palsy and a number of rare uh, genetic disorders. So it's a highly heterogeneous disorder now, and that has an impact in uh, the administration of, of therapies and the training, the lack of training, uh, uh, rather, uh, to handle these, these neurological issues. And, and so part of, the, part of the problem also is that and the, the, uh, the diagnosis is far too, too uh, late. So the average is uh, 4.3 to 4.5 years of age when the diagnosis is, is given in the US. So we would like to go earlier because then we could take advantage of that window of plasticity, very early plasticity um, in neurodevelopment. And what we know is that uh, babies already come to the world with a, a system that is measurable, with in particular the brainstem uh, has um, tremendous importance because it connects to the spinal cord where central pattern generators are and you need to con develop connections in the neocortex to control those top down. Uh, you have uh, subcortical structures like the basal ganglia, the striatum, that also are uh, participate in the control of movement. But most importantly, you have their uh, processing of sound, which uh, th propagates throughout uh, the various layers of the, of the brainstem on its way to uh, the primary auditory cortex. And the signal there is at microsecond time scale. So this structure will have to um, coordinate different time scales uh, at the millisecond time scale, the microsecond time scale is much, much finer. And it, it's, it thus provides a center for uh, coordinating, so like an anchor, so to speak, for coordinating all these disparate timings from information that has to be integrated into the motor stream and, and then uh, uh, serve as feedback to the, to the various centers of the, of the cerebral cortex, the cerebellum, uh, the basal ganglia, the spinal cord. So it's, a, it's a, in a way, it's a conduit of information sharing all these multiple timescales. So it's very important for the coordination of uh, all, all behaviors in humans. And is accessible at birth, and that's why uh, these these uh, archived records, dating all the way back to the late 1990s until uh, present time, are important. And I want to notice that um, part of the importance of doing this so early is that uh, humans are altricial mammals. Uh, they are born uh, with immature systems that need a lot of nurturing, and it they will. Uh, mature within the first year of age. And because of that, the early stages of development are in a very nonlinear accelerated rate. And a lot of things happen every day count. So the, the sooner that you uh, understand the problem and develop a methodology that can address those problems with a specificity of uh, personalized approach, the better. Uh, this is a, a, a power law scale of across species uh, that, that relates the weight of the brain with the amount of time that it takes to uh, start walking. And I want you to notice that the human babies are right up there. Uh, so it takes a long time for them to mature and develop before they start to walk. So therefore, we have to really pay attention to that first year of, of life and take advantage of the early plasticity and how the brain evolves over time in that very early period. So we need to diagnose earlier, and we have this routine auditory uh, screening uh, test that tests for auditory function for the intactness of the cranial nerve eight, and uh, it's portable and it's, it's available and it's done routinely and uh, with different uh, types of input we can uh, measure the, the outcome, the, the responses. And because it's been done uh, routinely uh, um, for so long, it has been well characterized. So we have a waveform that has seven peaks, and these peaks occur at particular 
uh, millisecond latencies that we can measure and estimate. Uh, and they are in correspondence with different layers uh, and different uh, stages of the, of the brainstem. So from, starting from the ear, all the way to the pons, the midbrain, and then finally the primary auditory cortex. And the type of um, input that I'm going to be uh, utilizing here is 70 decibels, uh, 75 decibels, and 80 decibels, which is audible already uh, range. And uh, this is uh, data collected at 25 kilohertz. So it's very high sampling resolution, so we can get to the type of uh, millisecond time scale resolution. So what I noticed when they gave me access to their data is that the underutilized information that lies in these little wiggles before the big peak, the big delta, Dirac delta response that you get from the brain, and the, and this, and the little wiggles after that in the refractory period after that spike. And I noticed that that was not being utilized, only the peak information was being utilized. But if you zoom in, you see that there is a lot of variability there that we could utilize. And likewise, in the uh, refractory period. And so this is uh, zooming in into that Dirac Delta uh, response, um, what it would look like. And that also can be looked at in terms of the features of that waveform, not only the amplitude in microvolts, but also uh, the prominence of the peak, which is from the base of the, the minimum there to the peak, uh, the width, which has to do with the sustained time of that waveform, and so forth. So there are a number of features in the waveform that you can look at the variations, at the fluctuations. And so um, that was the first thing. And, and here I'm showing you uh, one. Um, motivation for this uh, is the nonlinear rate of growth and the fact that babies grow daily and uh, the head also, the head circumference changes over, over time very rapidly. And so when you are utilizing this uh, information, these responses, you need to take care of the anatomical differences across babies to standardize the, the, the waveform and be able to compare across different babies and different ages and so forth. So this is a, an ongoing study in my lab that we, we send out um, a cell phone just to prove the point that maturation occurs very early and is tractable with uh, simple means like a cell phone and we take three minute videos and, and get the babies and do uh, 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 movements and, and perform analysis that can tell us how the baby is growing, the rate of growth, and the rate of neuromotor control development, the rate of volitional control, and so forth, and the different transitions. This is, we measure for 30 weeks, and we uh, the parents send us the, the data, so they're doing this at home. It's scalable, and so. Uh, Again, the, 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 the rate of growth is highly nonlinear. So here I'm, I'm uh, plotting estimated gestational age in weeks versus uh, body weight. And you see that there is a nonlinear uh, curve there. Um, and we have differences between non-ASD babies and ASD babies because this set of babies, we had the diagnosis three to four years later. And so, to adjust for those allometric effects that confound, would, would confound the analysis because of differences, anatomical difference in head circumference, we then take this, this ratio and, and we invented something called micro-movement spikes, which are the fluctuations that take place above the uh, empirically estimated mean of the waveform. And when you look at all those little wiggles that are otherwise uh, not utilized in the, in the current analysis, you see that there is a potential for a lot of information there that we are uh, missing. And so after we scale for allometric effects, we have a standardized waveform unit list from zero to one, but we preserve the timing of the peaks so we know exactly, uh, we maintain exactly the same uh, number of frames and information that we started with. And so one of the problems that we have across the board in the analysis of these type of variations in waveforms is that there is an assumption of a Gaussian distribution or, or a normal distribution uh, that, that then 
applies a one-size-fits-all model treatment to the data that is uh, very uh, disparate and it shouldn't be done that way. So when we looked at, um, at this uh, rectified, positive rectified uh, waveform and the wiggles that we, we got, then we realized that what the field is really doing is um, taking epochs of these waveforms, superimposing them and taking an average a mean based on the on the Gaussian uh, uh, assumption. This is a theoretical assumption, but the question then is, if we don't theorize about and actually empirically estimate the distribution or the family of distributions that characterize the statistics, the underlying stochastic process, these variations, what would happen? Well, how, how would we gain information? And the reason why we're losing information is because when you take the mean, which is the, the theoretical mean, the Gaussian theoretical mean, which is the black uh, curve there, and then two standard deviations above that is the red curve there. Uh, what is being done is wasting all of the gross data, all of the other information that uh, falls above the two standard deviations. So instead, what we're going to do, instead of take, taking epochs and assuming a distribution, we're going to estimate the family of distributions that these fluctuations above the empirical mean uh, are having. And when we do that, we discover that there's a whole family of distributions underlying each person. And how you navigate through those distributions and shift through those distributions is a fingerprint-like uh, signature of the person. So we can then truly personalize the, uh, the treatment of the data and in any uh, biosensing data or any other data that contains uh, time series or series of, of measurements uh, across the board. Uh, so that's the family. And, and then uh, we tested different families. And the gamma family of distributions, the continuous gamma family of distribution, was the one that, based on maximum likelihood estimation, which is a methodology that we use uh, in signal processing and so forth, uh, allowed us to uh, fit the data the best. This is the, the, the formula of the gamma distribution. It has two parameters, the shape and the scale, which tells you uh, the dispersion of the distribution, that's the scale, and the shape tells you the shape of the distribution. And you can track then information both in deliberate uh, movements and in spontaneous movements and in, in signals that are consciously uh, beneath awareness, but also in signals that are uh, largely beneath, uh, above awareness and beneath awareness. So we can uh, track all this information and we can come up with parameter spaces where we can plot each, uh, the data points of each individual as one data point with confidence intervals and we can track the stochastic shifts for that individual uh, as a function of, for example, the decibel levels that we are uh, giving them, like the, the, the different decibel levels. So these distributions change, they're non-stationary. This is very important because imagine that the field uh, across the board is assuming that it's a Gaussian distribution and that the system has a, a, sta a steady state, a uh, static uh, state, and in, it's, it's quite the opposite. It's a family of distributions, it's unique to this person, and it's non-stationary, so we have to pay attention to that. It shifts, and the rate at which it shifts will give us target information for de devising uh, different therapies and so forth. So here is an example of our project with the babies that we were tracking uh, in tandem uh, with the ABR uh, waveform. We were also tracking their growth and their neuromotor control development. And we, we were able to plot in, in a parameter space and characterize, and this has been done over thousands of individuals of different ages, and so now we have an empirical characterization of a parameter space where we can know when something is off the chart, where, when something is uh, significantly deviating from the uh, normative data. So we first characterize the normative data, and then we characterize the deviations, the, the departures from, from uh, normality. But importantly, we, we can track the distributions as they shift. And we can tell you then, uh, for example, that in the left upper quadrant, uh, that localizes processes that are exponential, that are random, that are um, 
very different from the ones in the right lower quadrant, where processes are predictive, are, are, are tending to Gaussian, and uh, have uh, low signal to noise ratio. We have discovered power laws that tell us about these uh, maturation processes across different uh, types of, uh, of data, and we can track these stochastic trajectories uh, uh, on the right-hand side of your, of your figure there as they change over time, so over weeks of development. And in autism in particular, we have been able to uncover a maturation power law, a maturation of the motor signature that tells us that in typical in typical development, neurodevelopment, you have a transition across uh, from exponential all the way to Gaussian. But in autism, this transition is not happening. There is excessive motor noise. And so there is uh, a lack of predictive code that needs to be um, uh, shifted so towards the, when you dampen the noise. And it's possible to do that. And so that gives us uh, information to characterize these uh, parameter spaces and the, the derive a target for treatment, which is dampening the motor noise so that the, uh, the system begins to have a better chance to integrate the information from multiple sensory modalities. So with that in mind, we have defined the worst case scenario, the best case scenario, a target for treatment, and we have now a pretty good empirical characterization of the biorhythmic activity of normative data and of data that departs from normative states, such as the case of autism. And it's, uh, it's possible to apply this to the various features of the waveforms. So for example, here, uh, we're doing it with the peaks prominence and uh, separating uh, unambiguously the autistic uh, case from the control case. Uh, so when we looked at the information from the neonates uh, utilizing this methodology and looking at the waveform of the response of the auditory brainstem response, what we found was that there was a fundamental difference in these signatures between the preterm babies that did not get a diagnosis of autism, even though they were preterm, the preterm babies who got a diagnosis of autism, the full-term babies with, who didn't have a diagnosis of autism, and the full-term babies with a diagnosis of autism. So, this methodology enables us to uh, unambiguously characterize these differences and track them over time. And in this particular case, we were able to separate based on the decibel levels of the input as well. So it, it gives us a way to now develop input, input um, uh, signals that can uh, uh, induce different levels of responses. And uh, in this way, we can then begin to characterize uh, types of inputs that will have therapeutic value, because then we can uh, identify the target and shift it. Um, this was a, uh, also the information reflecting differences for uh, babies who went on to have the diagnosis of autism versus babies who didn't uh, for the different decibel levels. So these are stochastic trajectories that, that tells the differentiate, unambiguous differentiation between autism and controls. And we can also identify clusters of uh, babies that um, have different, you know, combined with different weights and different uh, patterns of growth and uh, other, other clinical uh, information. So when we went and, so th those were based on the features of the waveform, and now we're going to uh, um, uh, report to you what we found in terms of the latencies of the peaks for each one of the seven peaks that uh, people uh, traditionally analyze in this, in this data set. So for each one of the peaks, uh, we found a shift a significant shift in the latency. So there are delays in the latency. So the sound processing is delayed uh, in the autistic, in the babies, in the neonates that went on to receive the diagnosis of autism and is delayed at each stage 
of the brainstem. So by the time it gets to the primary auditory cortex, it's significantly delayed. So these babies are processing the input. The sound processing is delayed. So when, you, when they have to integrate at microsecond time scale, when they have to integrate all of that sensory information with other sensory modalities like vision or proprioception or movement, pain, temperature, all the other afferent information that is a form of sensory input to the brain and has to be integrated at the brainstem, talking to everybody else, to the spinal cord, to the neocortex, to the cerebellum, to the subcortical structures, these babies are in trouble because the information is delayed and is, is, uh, is also um, very uh, different in terms of the bandwidth of information that they are receiving. So the, the babies that, are, uh, that did not get the diagnosis of autism went on to develop neurotypically as a broad bandwidth of information. They have access to all the frequencies and the latencies are broad. Okay, the babies in this uh, spectrum of autism has a very narrow bandwidth of information mm -hmm. and are shifted in a delayed fashion. So these two things are now quantifiable. I'm here now zooming in the information that I just told you. And so for each one of these, I'm plotting the um, empirically estimated probability distribution function as a function of the latencies in milliseconds. And so what you can see there is for each one of these stages from one to seven, you have a different, an unambiguous different probability distribution in the autistic neonates, the neonates that went on to receive the autism diagnosis in comparison with the uh, neurotypical uh, neonates. And this, this again, I'm, I'm going to reiterate what I just said. There is a shift, a delay in these latencies, significant. And there is, a, we're not talking here a p-value or a significant difference in a p-value. We're talking two different worlds. These are two different planets altogether, OK? Uh, so and, and, and if you see the dispersion of the distribution is very narrow. So that means that the, the variability that you want, the broad bandwidth that you want at first, uh, welcoming all the in sensory information is not there. They have access to just a slice of that sensory information in the sound domain. And so here we uh, obtain in, in milliseconds, the delays. And, and there are synaptic delays. There are delays that are uh, natural that you expect because the signal is traveling. So these are physical delays. But what we're talking about is in addition to that, what's happening. And when we cumulatively add all of that, uh, we come up with 1.74 milliseconds delay in the autistic system. And this is in a system that is computing at microsecond time scale. It's an order of magnitude. So this is very, very delayed. And so no wonder that there is this, I'm, I'm putting the, here this, this picture to kind of give you a sense of how they must be sensing the world. And again, uh, just to reemphasize that, this, that the, um, the brainstem is this conduit and it has uh, uh, connections to all these regions of, uh, of, of the neocortex, the cerebellum, and the subcortical structures. So that is, is, is a, an essential uh, a structure at the beginning of life that uh, we are already quantifying in a way uh, with this test that is routinely done. And, and I want just to invite you uh, to think about all this uh, symptomatology that we see in the, in the babies, in the toddlers, uh, spinning and, and shaking and all these so-called obsessive behaviors is nothing but a, a way of uh, trying to uh, uh, get an anchor, a frame of reference that aligns the timing because all this temporal information is disparate, is, is at different time scales and the brainstem has a chance to align them at microsecond time scale is not happening in their case because it's delayed and it's narrow. Uh, this is then we went on and did the same type of analysis in toddlers all the way and uh, young children all the way from 1.8 years of age to 6.8 years of age. And um, I won't go into the details, but it was consistent. Uh, so this, this remains throughout uh, the childhood if, if nothing is done about it. And, and lastly, 
uh, I want to just uh, call your attention to something called entropy that we measured. Uh, and you don't have to know the details about it, but just the color code in, in, uh, in the blue, which is very low entropy, is the neonates that are preterm. And in the yellow scale is the neonates that are full term. So when you are born full term, there is a better uh, chance that this, uh, this entropy in the signal uh, is, is, is broader. And, and that means that you're ready for welcoming all the sensory input and, and making sense out of it, as opposed to having a very narrow range of variations. The, the curve there is, for, is from over 233,000 babies from the state of Florida. We didn't have access to the diagnosis of autism there. This is just preterms and full terms of what you can see immediately uh, in the first two months of life, week by week, is that these babies that were uh, full term, and I'm plotting here females and males, had a sharp decrease in the delays, and uh, the preterm were uh, flat, no, no, no changes in the delay. So if you don't do something about it, it's not going to fix itself. So that means that a, a very early intervention that uh, shifts these delays is, is, and broadens the, the bandwidth of information is really critical. OK, in conclusion, uh, we there is information buried in this gross data that is currently discarded. Uh, so I invite people to think about that. Uh, the broad variability in latency uh, ranges at birth at, at each peak is in the, in the brainstem uh, region. So it, normally there's broad variability, and that's a good thing at birth because it welcomes all of the information. So if it's narrow, it's not good. Uh, there are quantifiable delays, and with very little cost and effort, we can then transform a routine hearing test that is already being done uh, in, into a, the earliest uh, screener uh, for autism uh, spectrum disorder. Uh, disorders and all disorders, because once if we do this uh, this uh, study at a scale, we can then differentiate different subtypes of autism that now in the very large heterogeneous uh, set of disorders that we have buried in this uh, very broad diagnosis system. So this is uh, a winner uh, uh, for for us. Uh, for everybody, and I hope that people see that so that they fund our our study, we're asking for to do this at a scale in 3,000 babies. And it would be much like the, the growth chart uh, that you have to do, build a growth, a growth chart of the brain stems and the latencies and the information buried in that variability that we're throwing away otherwise with wrong assumptions. So I'll take questions. Uh, Dr. Torres. Um, I just remember when I was trying to figure out um, what was going on with Garrett, we um, did take him to do a hearing test. And um, I just remember he wasn't able to do it. Like it was kind of a nightmare. So I was wondering, have they changed perhaps like in like the last 20 years, the way they're actually implementing it so that all children could participate? Yes. I mean, the, this is done, uh, well, uh, over 233,000 uh, neonates, and and then we got uh, like 70 uh, records from uh, toddlers and children. So the, this is being done uh, now routinely and uh, with means that are not uncomfortable or anything like that. Uh, uh, and it, you know, as a neonate, they they just do it. Uh, later on, uh, they do it as well. Uh, at least in Florida and in the state of New York, um, yeah, it's 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 a routine test. Um, Is that the difference? Like twenty years ago, they didn't do it on babies because he was, yeah me, he was me, yeah child. twenty years ago it wasn't being done. Okay. This is uh, more like the state of New York gave us data since like the early two thousands that was readable. Uh, so, thank you. Yeah, Elizabeth. Uh, that's fantastic. I'm so glad that you can dig on this data. So for the uh, New York, um, you are talking about hundreds or thousands of... Uh, yeah, they have. but uh, So they have thousands of records, but we only had access to about 70 because um, a variety of reasons. Uh, we needed for 
the, to report it on a paper, we needed to have um, the same machinery, the same kind of, uh, and they had shifted different machines over the years because the technology right. obviously advances. Uh, and so the, also the same stimuli. And so we wanted to have these three levels of decibel. So it, it really, and then, and then we needed to have uh, babies that were tracked over time until they got the diagnosis. So that funneled down the data to just about 70 records. And then, uh, you know, it, it just declines the number of, of, of records that you can have. Okay. Um, no, that, I'm, I'm glad to know that. Uh, my question is related to, I think, the last point that you mentioned, because it's such a heterogeneous population, right? right. And uh, nonetheless, we're still seeing like something that um, is quite robust. Um, how do you explain that? I mean, do we have any other either genetic or clinical information on those 70 cases? How similar are they? How different are they? Uh, because, I mean, you are getting something that seems like so fundamental yeah. early on that might be like common across different subtypes. That's right. So excellent question. And that was one of the reasons why uh, also the, the number of records that we were able to analyze decreased because we wanted to have a balanced um, um, heterogeneous ethnicity. So we had to have all kinds of ethnic uh, babies that we try to include. Um, we excluded, for example, um, babies from drug users or um, very uh, or alcohol uh, syndrome or uh, babies that um, came from um, a lot of trauma during the birth, things like that we had to exclude. Um, but the, the group here is very heterogeneous in terms of um, economic status and uh, and uh, ethnicity, and we were able to do that because the state of New York has been doing this since the late 90s. So the records are quite broad. And we also had the motion data from the videos. Uh, so that's, that's another reason why the, the number of babies re was reduced. But that's an excellent point. Um, that's why we need at least 3,000 babies so that we can uh, look at, because it'll be about two point something percent uh, of, of that is going to bring the diagnosis of autism. And then there is the other issue of females that you know that it's only like four to five males for each female. So none of these records with the diagnosis of autism has enough statistical power to get females accounted for. So that was another thing we had to f get enough females so that we knew uh, we could compare uh, across males and females, but these are all very good questions. But these are these are current problems with the diagnosis that system that we have, um, and you know it'll be a challenge because three thousand babies you think is a lot, but it's not because of the heterogeneous. Statistically, it's not so, but it will give us a chance to subtype at least a few. Um, so hopefully we get we we submitted a grant to the NIH and so we're hoping fingers crossed we get it and we can do it. Yeah. All right. Thank you very 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 okay. very very much. That was great.